if China is recovering, it's certainly not obvious looking at the price action in commodity markets. Why do you think that is? Look, I, I think that's a, a great question because you're actually competing two different forces here. One is, you know, the, the financial market is really looking at, A, the rising U.S. dollar, and two, the, the risk of, of the global economy slowing down, particularly the U.S. Now, you know, with, with, with financial markets looking in, in that direction, we've certainly seen base metals and oil react to that. But when you look at how uh, China is opening up and recovering, I think there is still uh, a lot of caution on, in terms of how this recovery will take place. Keep in mind that that PMI uh, that we talked about, and particularly the improvement in new orders, it was actually export orders that really grew quite a bit. And that's something that is probably going to be unsustainable given that, that global growth concern. So uh, I think there's, there's credible doubt in terms of how uh, China's uh, commodity demand impulse can grow from here. Um, but the markets have certainly in June focused on some of the risks to the global economy. And, and that's been the big factor when we talk about what's weighing on, on commodity demand and, and sentiment. Uh, su suffice to say, what you're saying, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is the declines we had in June, that likely continues? Look, our, our view is that that's, that's correct, that we are going to see through this year um, more pressure built. Um, I'd say, you know, it's going to be different for different commodity classes. For energy, we definitely see demand destruction playing out by the end of this year and prices to fall as a result of that. On, on base metals, we think the market has probably overreacted to the downside, uh, particularly given the fact that China is still going to be uh, potentially adding solid demand support um, by the end of the year if the infrastructure investment comes through as promised. Keep in mind that, that when it comes to, to, to base metals, China accounts for about 40 to 60 percent of, of base metal consumption. So when we talk about stimulus in China and what China does, it has enormous bearings when we talk about uh, metal market. Vivek, we saw the warning for stratospheric $380 a barrel oil from JP Morgan, and this was sort of uh, against the fear that there could be retaliation for the price cap mechanism and other sanctions against Russia. Is that risk something that's on your radar? Look, I think when we break down what's happening with oil, I think there's a difference between, say, oil uh, that we talk about in terms of its impact on, on the real economy and what's happening more on refined products. Keep in mind that, that diesel and petrol is what hits the real economy. And, and that is something that, in our view, is something that is being missed, that, that it is that aspect of it which is structurally in, in um, struggling to, to produce enough to really meet uh, global demand. And, and there's a number of factors to that. You know, global refining capacity rolled backwards last year for the first time in 30 years. Uh, Russia's refining capacity is like about 30 percent is idle. Um, and then on top of that, we've got R Russia's, uh, um, China's restrictions on, on exports. You know, diesel exports were at the lowest level in seven years in, in May. Now, that has meant that diesel in particular has been very, very tight. And, and that is something that when we look at that is what's, what's hurting the developing and emerging market economies the most right now. Um, and, and, you know, that is where the, the pressure point will be. And I'm not saying we're seeing enormous demand destruction at this point, but as we go through 2022, we expect that to be a factor. And, and that is something that we're watching very, very closely. But oil will be more reactive early on because it will re respond to the financial market conditions. And, and the chance of recession means oil will fall more steeply. But when we look at, at oil, certainly it'll eventually play um, its role in that, mm -hmm. that weaker refined product demand will translate through to weaker oil prices. And that's why we're calling $100 a barrel by, by the fourth quarter this year. There does seem to be demand destruction when it comes to iron ore exports from Australia, though, despite the optimism over China and the infrastructure investment uh, rollout there as well. Do you see that being sustained and does that slippage just continue? When it comes to iron ore, it's very much a, a China-centric question. And when you look at, at, at the current uh, steel market in China, it really is signaling oversupply. You look at, at steel stockpiles, for instance, in China, in, in the 17 weeks since stockpiles peaked this year, we've actually seen um, steel stockpiles fall about 14%. Now, typically, when you, you talk about uh, this period after steel stockpiles, peak in, uh, steel stockpiles peak in China, we're talking about, you know, a 30 to 50 percent fall 
in steel stockpiles by now. So, you know, steel stockpiles definitely are highlighting that we are in an oversupply territory in China. And now when we look at that and we, we look at the fact that as we have this, this COVID zero policy pushing through and property construction still remaining uh, very, very subdued in China, it's very difficult to, to look at the future in terms of infrastructure investment coming to save the day when the current situation is really pointing at, at demand concern. And, and that is why I know um, has fallen, particularly over the last few weeks, and something that we think is completely justified given current market conditions. And, and do you put that down, you know, the drawdown only being at 13 percent because of the COVID containment strategy, or is there something else? In other words, what I'm trying to get to here, the risk seems binary when it comes to this, when it comes to the housing market, for example. So, you know, what are the big risks you're looking at here that might actually lead to a massive drawdown in stockpiles there? Sure. So the, the first and foremost would be a relaxation of, of China's COVID zero policy. That could see infrastructure investment cool. really rebound. And that's not to say we didn't see in June um, a significant uptick in the construction subco uh, subcomponent of the non-manufacturing PMI. That is very much indicative that infrastructure has picked up. And, you know, it went from, you know, low 50s to 56.6. And, and, you know, you look at that and it's like, oh, we definitely saw China's demand pick up. But can we see that sustained to the end of the year? That would be contingent on not seeing an, another flare-up, another widespread lockdown. And right now, there's there's no widespread confidence that we can really say that with China, um, just given how highly transmissible that that Omicron variant is. So, you know, you know, if we do see some 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 meaningful re reduction in that that stance, that's mm. really going to be key if we're going to see a massive rebound in in, in steel demand and iron ore demand. 